everyone, or maybe in Kazakhstan, it's good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very honored and pleased to be here today to join you with the webinar. And thanks so much uh, to Alia uh, for getting this uh, together. And uh, Michael, also thanks to uh, Volker, uh, Professor Volker, uh, uh, who is moderating the webinar. And so what I would do today is to give you a very brief introduction of the doctoral programs and the CEP MLP and School of Social Sciences. So the focus would be CEP MLP. I initially I put the full name there, but it was very crowded. So I just thought, okay, it's easier to make it uh, CEP MLP, but uh, which stands for Center for Energy, Petroleum and Mineral Law and Policy. So I will just talk about the center uh, in a moment. But uh, first of all, I would give you a general picture about the PhD students and the School of Social Sciences, um, which would show you the uh, general number there and also would show you the disciplines here. You can see we have got architecture and urban planning, CEP, MLP, geography, law, politics, and psychology. So six disciplinary um, divisions uh, this is not the latest number with about like 135, 100 to 150 students. Uh, so this is kind of, you know, the roughly still uh, accurate two, three months ago, but uh, maybe a little bit different. But we have got those disciplines and the CPLP is the one I'm going to concentrate to introduce, not just because uh, we are from CPLP, but also because this is very much related to natural resources and, uh, you know, um, and transition related uh, topics, which may be interesting to many of you. Um, so CPLP uh, is the globally renowned institution of higher education and academic research in the field of natural resources and energy studies. It has been there for 43 years. Uh, so it's one of the you know, uh, longest um, historical kind of institutions in higher uh, education. Uh, it is quite different from many other institutions in the higher education uh, sector. One is because this is a postgraduate only institution, which is not very common uh, in the university system. So we have got only taught postgraduates and doctoral uh, programs. And also another distinct uh, feature is, uh, of us is interdisciplinary. We have got energy law, energy economics, energy management, and energy diplomacy. So basically, we covered much more, uh, you know, fields than many other law, for instance, uh, energy law institutions. There are a few in the world, but we are the only one which uh, is interdisciplinary and also covered three to four subjects. Uh, and also, uh, it is international. So we have got a uh, staff team international, about uh, maybe seven, eight from seven, eight nationalities, and also students from uh, more than 80 countries uh, around the world. Uh, and then our PhD program is also, you can see from the number I have shown you uh, previously, it is the largest group within the School of Social Sciences. We always have 50 plus uh, PhD students and any one time. The peak time was 60 something. So now it's 50 plus. Um, and also it is interdisciplinary as I have said, um, which is CPLP. Uh, but then because we gave each uh, students two supervisors. So very often the PhD research is also interdisciplinary and we can provide such a kind of you know, variety of uh, supervision capacity as well. Uh, and also we have fortnightly staff PhD seminars 
which would allow the staff to give a presentation uh, about their research and also a PhD student to also present their own research. Then the feedbacks from uh, the staff members and students will be available to help the students to improve their uh, research, which was uh, much appreciated by our students. And also we have got training events from various uh, sources from the school level, the center's level, school level, and also now the university has got a doctoral academy, which would also provide certain training uh, to our students. Uh, and also students are encouraged to present their research and national or international workshops. So if you do present your work, we would provide certain financial support as well. So those are the main activities we uh, would cover here as a P CPLP. And also now I want to talk about the, the PhD program and the professional doctoral programs. So those are two similar programs, but to have some uh, differences. The can PhD I, program. Yes. I, I'm sorry. Do, do you have your PPT on? Yes. Yes. But can you not see it? No, we cannot see your PPT. We were texting on the chatting and no one of us can see your PPT. Oh, can that's interesting. So what did I uh, stop? I, I was sharing. So, okay, I'll, I'll share again. Yeah. Ah, this is interesting. Thank you. Sorry I'll for stopping again. you. Share screen. Yeah. No, 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 don't worry. Uh, I think this should be the one. Can you see this now? Now that we can you, see you it should. properly. It was the... Uh, you can. Oh, sorry. Yeah, now we can see it properly. It's good. Okay, thank you. Sorry, yeah. uh, did you see the, the slide before? Do, do you want me to just go back a little bit? Uh, yeah, if you want. We, we okay. didn't see any slides yeah. before. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize that. Sorry about that. Okay. I'll just give this uh, very briefly. Uh, I'll repeat. So this, you can see the different disciplines within the uh, School of Social Sciences. So we have six disciplines, architecture and urban planning, CEP, MLP, geography, law, politics, and psychology. So you can see the numbers of PhD students. We are the biggest, even doubles the, the next, you know, um, more than doubles the next, uh, you know, uh, level of the number of students. So the student number varies, uh, you know, from disciplines, but we are always the biggest group because we are postgraduate only. Uh, so this is what I have talked about, you know, our features, uh, postgraduate only, interdisciplinary and international. So that is very distinct, even within the uh, school and the university. Uh, so I have just talked about the largest group and the interdisciplinary, even, you know, we can provide different uh, supervisors from different disciplines to uh, guide your uh, research. And we have got fortnightly staff PhD seminars and training events. Also, you know, students are reached to attend um, workshops outside of the university. And if you present your research work, we will provide, uh, you know, financial support. There, there is a limit, of course, but we will try our best to support everyone. Okay. And so here now I will start to talk about the um, PhD program, about the uh, entry requirements and how, I mean, you can, well, what kind of, you know, um, issues you should pay attention to if you want to apply for our PhD program. So we have got two kinds of PhD programs. I mean, doctoral programs. One is called PhD, which is Doctor of Philosophy. The other one is professional uh, doctoral program. Okay, I'll talk about both of the programs to you. So both are for four year uh, of uh, studies. The PhD program, has got full-time and part-time. So entry requirements, we want academic performance to be good enough. Minimum 2.1 for bachelor's degree and merit for master's degree. So that is uh, the academic 
uh, performance. And also we need the research proposal, which is three to five pages to show your research interest and the main ideas, which would not need to be perfect because that is just like, you know, you haven't entered the program, but we need to know what you want to do. Then we can see, do we have the capacity to surprise you and to identify the potential surprisers? Um, so you, we need the research proposal, but of course some professors, some supervisors even wanted a very substantive one. I think, you know, you, you, you can just try your best to make it, uh, you know, as good as possible, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, three to five, five pages, your topic, your, you know, uh, research question, your methodology. So that is basically should be uh, a literature review if you can have some. Okay, and else, this is English language. Um, for full time, I mean, for PhD, we require minimum 6.5, but no elements is below 6.0. Uh, then when you come, you can, you know, still, you can study here, then you can uh, attend various activities. So we hope you will improve your English language um, during your, your period of study. Um, the fees, um, this every year will have a little bit, maybe a increase, but 2020 to 2021 is 18,000 annually. Okay. Uh, and for PhD program, we have got two entry times. One is January and the other is September. Uh, this is in principle, but uh, if you really, you have got difficulties, visa or whatever, then it is possible for you to join us uh, at another time. But in general, we have twice, uh, you know, entry time because then we have induction program, you know, those kind of uh, activities will be held during those uh, around uh, the, the entry time. Uh, and then the upgrade is around 12 months after you commence your studies. And then by that time, you need to have a substantive proposal, which is not three to five pages, at least maybe 30 to 50 pages, you know, and also the design of your research has to be substantive. Okay, so this is basically what we uh, would require if you want to apply for a PhD program. And you can find more from the, um, link here I have provided. And the other type, I guess maybe could be really interesting to many of you as well, which is called professional doctorate program. Also four years, it's called PDP. It's four years as well. Um, the key requirements for admission, um, it's basically quite similar, I would say, it's two one for bachelor's and married for master's. However, because this is called professional doctorate program, we could have, you know, um, taken into consideration of your work experiences. For instance, you, if you have got like a, uh, five, 10 years of work experience and is, you know, established, uh, you know, in your field, we can, you know, consider that and to offset some of those uh, requirements. If there is a little bit, you know, something insufficient, we, we won't mind that much. Okay. And also research proposal is, is quite similar. We need to know what you, you really want to do uh, and to also to uh, identify the likely supervisor for you. Here, IELTS is 7.0, which I did check with the director of the uh, PDP uh, of the university. And they said they do want a higher IELTS because um, for this program, you may not come to the UK to stay here to study with us. So if the language is not up to standard, then it's very difficult for anybody to proceed later on because mainly you will be in your uh, home country. So they did say they, they need else to be 7.0 and no element is below 7.0. You can see that from this link here I have provided as well. Uh, and uh, 
uh, but uh, but if, for instance, you you got six point zero or six point five, processional English language is on offer. So if you you do have the time, you know, to come here for a few months, then that is possible. Then later on, if you reach to the standard, uh, we we will be happy to admit. So here, the key differences from a PhD degree. Um, it suits well with those who want to stay in the profession instead of going for academia. So PhD is, you know, I would say required maybe by most of the countries nowadays, if you want to work in a university. But for professional doctorate uh, program, you, you don't have the intention to go to academia. You have been established in your profession. You want to stay there, but you want to, you know, enhance yourself better. So this would be suitable for you to consider, like uh, uh, some some people in the nursing industry, in the education, like uh, not higher education, but, uh, you know, they, they are studying education or those kind of professions. They want to stay there and they, they, they have no intention to change their job. Then this would be suitable. And also, um, there is another key difference. Entry time is January only. I have talked about January and September for PhD, but for PDP, it's January only. Why is that? It's because this program will have the first two years doing coursework. And also, you have only one supervisor appointed initially. Because at the first two years, you don't have to develop your research proposal in a substantive way, like a 12 months time, you have to be upgraded. You need to have two years of, you know, coursework. And then during this period, you will develop your uh, research proposal, uh, you know, to a, to a complete kind of way, and then to be upgraded. So, uh, if they have to organize the coursework, then they need to have these batches, you know, to, to be uh, entered at the same time. Um, but you think you can, you know, have this kind of, you know, um, PDP studies um, remotely, but there is a requirement. They require two intensive six day residential study per year. So you should be prepared to come to Dundee twice a year, each of the time, six days, which is a week. Then you can meet with your supervisor and then the, maybe some of the, the, the instructors of the modules and to discuss about your study and whatever. And also with interactive online learning. So mainly you will be doing online learning you know, taking courses uh, and also self-study uh, occurring between times. So you have to be really self-disciplined very well to get this done. This is a link you can see from uh, our uh, website for PDP, okay. Um, and those are the examples of our current research topics. Um, it's just really an example to show you different kinds of, you know, fields we are covering and also, um, you know, different uh, uh, research topics. So that is basically what I have got here to, uh, for you about our PhD program. I think what I, I, I know you have got some questions which I will be happy to answer, but uh, I guess maybe for the moment, Alia, uh, perhaps I should give the time to our students, then they will give a presentation later on. I will answer the questions. Uh, or, yeah. What do you think? Yes, sure. Volker is here, I think. Volker. Professor Volker, are you here? Hello. Hello, Volker. Hello. I'm sorry, Hi. I had some. Hello, I had some difficulties logging in. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Hello, everybody. Hello. Yeah. So let's move to our. Uh, and then follow up with questions and answers. Alia, we could not hear I think she just said that let's move to the next speaker. So maybe Professor Volker can start moderating us so that we can know who's going to speak first.
if that's okay. Janet, are you there? Janet? Yes, so yes, Volker. Volker, do you... Our presentations and then follow up on questions and answers. Sorry, Alia, we can't really hear you clearly. Um, Volker, maybe you, you could now, uh, you know, ask the students to give a presentation. I'll, I'll answer questions later. I don't want to take too much of their time. Okay. Please. Uh, Thank you. Because I, I only joined later, do we have a, uh, do, do we have a preferred order of, uh, of presentations now, currently? Or do I start? No, you, you, you would decide. <laughs> Yes, I decide. Decide. Okay, <laughs> then I would uh, I would give uh, the give the floor to uh, to Betty first. Is that okay, Betty? Yeah, that's fine. I'll be ready for that. Yeah. Good. Thank Please you. go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, I will start sharing my screen. So, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So I will start. Um, my presentation. Thank you very much to, uh, hang on a second, sorry. Do I need to show my video? Okay. Thank you very much to Alia and Professor Falker and Janet and all the colleagues and friends that I have here. Uh, I'm going to share about my PhD. I just finished my PhD and I just graduated last week on Thursday. So about my PhD at the center, I did a PhD on the petroleum economics and management. And uh, today I will share the result of the PhD of my thesis. So I will discuss about how to track the energy investment through taxation policy and with a case study, coal bed methane taxation regime in Indonesia and comparing with the US and Australia. So here is a little bit of my journey. So I graduated in 2008 and then my background was accounting and I worked for Ernst & Young for two years and a half and then oil and gas companies for three years. When my master in uh, at the Coventry University and then I, I went back to the oil and gas company and then worked for the Ministry of uh, Energy in my country and then finally I did my PhD. So here is the picture of my graduation on Thursday. So it was a great opportunity for me to have a, to do a PhD at the center. I'm sure you will see the testimony from the video that I have. So today I'm, I will be very quick uh, in presenting about my PhD. So I will be speaking on the research background and then what was the preliminary, pre preliminary findings on my PhD before I did my, collect, my data collection and my, my research, my field trip, sorry, my field work uh, in my PhD. And then finally the findings about the issues and how, how is the taxation modification can actually attract the uh, energy investment in Indonesia. So here's some of the background. Uh, as you all know that Indonesia is the fourth most populous, uh, population, uh, populous country. We have 270 million people in our country. And here is the map of my country. And with a lot of people there, you can see how much electricity that we, we are currently producing and the coal bed methane, the most uh, resourceful area are here and here. And you can see that they have less electricity supply compared to Java Island, which is the most, um, say most developed island in Indonesia. For those who don't know what is coal bed methane, uh, coal bed methane is, uh, is classified as an unconventional hydrocarbon. So if you know, uh, if you heard about shale gas from the US and shale oil, they are also part of the, of the unconventional hydrocarbon. So the reason why they are being classified as unconventional hydrocarbon is because the way you attract, sorry, you, the way you extract the, 
the gas or the oil have a sort of like a it's not like you cannot you cannot just use the conventional uh, equipment for example the vertical drilling rig you cannot just use the vertical but you have to do some more things or you have to do more uh, technology on that so that you can extract the gas or the oil so they have completely different uh, way of extracting the resources so here is part of my infographic on my PhD. So again, talking about the background. So we do have, we, we do have the CBM projects in Indonesia and we started in 2008. I know it's a little bit small here, but as you can see, this is the number of the CBM projects in Indonesia. So despite having uh, 453 trillion cubic feet of CBM resources, we haven't produced anything yet until today. And if you, if you see from the beginning of the project, it was 2008 and now it's 2019, sorry, 2020, we don't have production from the coal bed methane and it is dying at this moment. And even it's going down, uh, the number of the project is 27 in 2019. We don't know yet how many blocks that are going to be stopped by the government or um, by the investor themselves uh in 2020 and uh the next years and uh, and talking about the supply of the cbm it can actually uh provide an impact a good impact for the local society because first it can give an energy access and it can also encourage or drive the economic activities in the local and eventually it will also have uh, impact on the economic growth nationally. So I will talk about the issue later on and it's, uh, it's really very much uh, attached with the government paradigm in my country. So the preliminary finding before I did all this primary data collection, all the data collection that I did, uh, the, re the reason why the CBM is not developed very well or even like it's going to die is because of the fiscal system that we are applying uh, in Indonesia. So a uh, fiscal system is a taxation system that uh, every country applies to all the resources. So there are some types of uh, fiscal system. There are production setting contract, royalty tax system, service contract, and revenue sharing agreement. So all these can be called as fiscal system. Uh, also, even two or three countries have the same fiscal system. They don't necessarily have the same terms in their fiscal systems. For example, PSC. PSC in Indonesia is not the same as PSC in Malaysia or in Nigeria. Or maybe, uh, I'm not sure Kazakhstan is applying PSC or royalty tax, but uh essentially each country has their own terms in their fiscal system regardless of what the system are and after i found out about this preliminary finding i did a i did a field trip back home to to figure out what are the actual issues that related to the cbm development in my country so i did the local impact local uh, survey so i was looking at the local impact and the local expectation towards the cbm project in indonesia and then i did an interview with some investors uh, government and uh, some academia as well as the consultancies uh, both globally and uh, nationally like domestic consultancy and then the last thing that i did was the focus group discussion so in the focus group discussion i i gathered all these different stakeholders into one room and then we had a discussion about this uh, coal bed methane development in Indonesia. As a, uh, talking about the local community, why did I look at the local community? As we all know that the local community uh, is very much, uh, they are very much uh, attached to the energy development there. So the energy development, uh, whatever it is, in this case is the CBM, they have a uh, direct uh, impacts to the local communities. And instead of, it's not, the, it's not the whole country that has the direct impact of this energy development, but 
we all know about the corporate social responsibility and it's all everything related to the local community. So here, why I look at this local community because the local community is a very important stakeholder in any energy development. The, uh, the energy, it has, um, some research has shown the, uh, the relationship between how good the company when dealing with the society will impact to their project sustainability and as well as the financial performance of their company itself. So when the company uh, has a good social responsibility, it most likely that the project will sustain more than those companies that don't do anything for the society. So as a result of my data collection, here are the five main issues in the CBM project development in Indonesia. So first is related again with the fiscal and regulation issues, technical issues, it's more related to uh, the CBM and the tools, the equipment and the technology that being used, uh, that are being used for the CBM development. And again, it's, co it's connected to the fiscal regime as well. And then there's investor related issues because there, there has been financial problem and then local community issues and government paradigm. From all these five issues, the most fundamental issue is the government paradigm. So the government doesn't seem apply, apply their own paradigm, as in they have this paradigm that is written in the government regulation saying that the energy resources is, should not be a revenue generation, but it should be an um, engine of growth for the national development. Yet the government still focus on getting money from all the resources that we have. So they, they are not looking at the, uh, what you call for it, at the domino effect or the impact of like the global impact as a whole from an energy development. If we think about the energy development in, in the areas, in the isolate, isolated, isolated areas, these isolated areas not necessarily, like for example, in my country, because my country is a big country and there are some, places that have not been touched by the government in terms of the infrastructure development. The investor can actually do something for the community there without having the government uh, doing infrastructure directly. They can actually see the impact from having the energy investor there to develop the local communities. So the government hasn't seen this yet they have heard it, but they haven't seen, they haven't applied the government paradigm. They only look at how much money we can get from the resources. So that's the main issue. Once, it's, uh, once this issue is solved, I'm sure that everything else will follow. So here is the interconnectivity between all these uh, stakeholders. So there, there needs an action from the government by improving the fiscal system, by applying the paradigm itself. And then for the investor, they should be more strategic in their project. And with the local community, there should be an involvement from the local community so that the local community can uh, eventually uh, get the direct impact, the financial benefits from the investor, and they will eventually support the project that is in their area. So to, 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 to address these issues, I was looking at different fiscal system that applies uh, in the US and also Australia. How are these terms from the US and Australia actually uh, can be adopted, can be actually adopted to Indonesian PSC? So the reason why I chose uh, Australia and the US are because the first reason was because that they have uh, the most advanced for coal bed methane development, and they're being very successful in their in their um, in their CBM development. The second reason is because they have similar geological condition with Indonesia. So I suppose with those uh, two assumptions, two similarities, that Indonesia should be able to uh, apply some of the terms into Indonesian PSC. 
Uh, so here are the results, and I will take one example uh, from this uh, from this comparative study result. So the five, sorry, the six uh, terms that we can uh, adopt is the the Wyoming royalty tax from the royalty system that they have from the how they split the royalty between the state and the federal government and then the severance tax or ad valorem tax that being applied uh, in uh, in the US uh, and these severance tax are actually a local tax so they are not paid to the federal government but they are paid to the state government and then the flexibility in related to the cost recovery procedures uh, cost recovery is only applied to production sharing contract instead of royalty tax and in the cost recovery procedures, uh, the investor has to comply every regulation, every rules, including how to, uh, how to procure their equipment and everything to start developing or to do the project. So they have to comply. Otherwise, if they are not complying the regulation, they will not be cost, uh, their cost will not be recovered through their production. So they have to comply to the government regulation to actually recover their costs at the end. So in this case, CBM needs more flexibility for recovering, sorry, for the procedures in uh, recovering the cost. Um, the fourth thing is the uplift rate. So the uplift rate being applied in the PRRT is actually uh, it works like uh, it works like a future value. So uh, they future value the expenditures. So those outstanding expenditures is being uh, carried forward and it's compounded by certain amount of percentage being uh, defined by the government in Australia. So. In Australia, it's applied to the exploration expenditures. But here I propose that the uplift rate should be applied for the community development expenditures. So the investor will actually be uh, motivated to do something more for the society because they know that they will, they will have these expenditures uh, compounded. So it will add to their cost, which means first they will, it will, it's, it's not an actual cost, it's an accounting cost, but they will reduce the amount of tax that they will pay. And also they can actually get more costs being recovered in their cost recovery. So the next is the ring fence policy. Ring fence policy is the policy where uh, a company cannot, cannot, so ring fence, for example, if it's, um, so the company cannot uh, net off the exploration cost or production cost in one field to another field. So if it's a block basis ring fence policy, if there are five wells in one block, this can be net off because the ring fence is a block basis. But if it's a field basis, that means the one field that has a production and the other field that doesn't have a production, which means there will be all sunk costs and being a loss for the company cannot be recovered in different fields that has a production. So in this case, the ring fence policy that I proposed is only for development expenditures and not for the exploration expenditures. So it will encourage investors to do more exploration, to find more gas, in Indonesia. And the last thing is about the sliding scale split to protect both government and investor cash flow. A sliding scale split is uh, a way, a system where, where, where it can balance both sides. So when the production is high, the government, the government will get, will get a uh, uh, so at the beginning of the, sorry, at the beginning of the production, the production will not as high as when it's peak. So when it's not high, the, when it's low production, the, the investor will get a higher percentage. 
but when it uh, along the production is growing is developing is increasing the the investor will reduce the percentage and the government will get a better percentage so that's the sliding scale split so just one quick example about the royalty system in the us so in the us the royalty is paid to both federal government and to the state in indonesia we have what it is called the first trans petroleum here and this works like a royalty but the first trans petroleum is not shared between the government and the investor and it's only paid to the federal government or the central government and in in the us there is a royalty here that being paid to the state government and to the federal government so here the ftp here that i proposed is being paid to the central government and also to the local government. The idea here is to also giving a direct financial contribution to the local community development rather than just going straight to the central government and you have no, you don't know when it will provide benefits for the local government. So, that was just one example from all this, uh, all this uh, result that I have. So now I will go to the conclusions. So that it is the fact that government is still main, is still the main actor in the any energy development in any country, and it uh, they have significant roles in changes the fiscal uh, in changing the fiscal taxation policy in a country. And it is really depending to the government itself uh, if they want to attract or improve the attractiveness of the in energy investment. And again, the paradigm is important. And if Indonesia apply the paradigm, everything else will follow. And there is an important uh, relationship between the community engagement, the community and the investor, because again, it will help the project to sustain for uh, for a long time. And the last time, the last one is the taxation regime. It's actually one of the main tool to accommodate the government and the investors interest in energy project. I think I think this is all from me. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and you got something from it. And if you have any question, uh, I will I will answer hopefully through this uh, webinar or maybe by Facebook as uh, Alia already mentioned and here are my contact if you want to ask more you can contact me and thank you so much uh, for the time uh, for now I will give it back to Professor Volker yes thank you very much Betty uh, before you leave um, there is a question for you do you uh, maybe you have uh, time to answer it and the question yeah. is the question is, um, what do you think about uh, coal gasification and liquidif liquidification technology? Well, liquidification, yeah. did, you, did you look into this during your research? So the CSG, the coal steam gasification, yes, I didn't look at that. It's been actually proposed in my country. Instead of having the CBM, they were proposing about having the coal seems uh, coal gasification. Um, it is it is not viable right now in my country, but uh, and it it is indeed a great idea because looking at the CBM is not developed right now. Another way of producing the gas from the coal is by have uh, by make it like to into a gas or liquid uh, liquidification however in my country it hasn't been started yet and um, i would say uh, i would say the csg is an option it's an option for cbm but again it will probably have to create a new contract on the coal gasification because it's different than the coal bed methane itself. The coal bed methane is a gas that is trapped in the coal. But the coal gasification, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong. 
coal gasification is that you burn the coal and you get the, ca the gas and you take the gas out of it. So you produce the gas from the coal itself. If I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Betty. Very, very interesting. Uh, if there are currently no other, I don't see any other uh, questions, but there may be one, uh, one or the other one that uh, will be directed um, directly to you after the seminar um, by the listeners. Uh, so um, this is an opportunity to move on uh, to our next speaker. Um, Dilip, are you ready? Yes, Professor Volker, I'm ready. Just let yes, Dilip and I have been working closely on a um, on a book where um, Dilip has been fantastic, uh, and um, so I'm extremely. I'm ex I know he had to sacrifice time. Uh, from his PhD to help me with the book, but uh, you will, we will see that nevertheless he's uh, he's 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 making excellent progress. So, uh, Dilip, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Volker, and thank you, Janet, and thank you, Alia, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I have a question first. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see yes. it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Just in case if you face that uh, any difficulty in my presentation or at any point of time, if slide goes up, just let me know so that I can project it back. Thank you so much. Uh, my project revolves around the supply security and basically looking into how a country can ensure the security of supplies, given that uh, uh, the electricity system uh, in general is transitioning towards more greener system. So with more greener system, there could be challenges that we probably might not have evaluated. And to overcome those challenges, um, we need to look into the energy systems and in particular electricity systems very carefully. So uh, my research revolves basically around looking into the reliability of energy systems. Uh, my major themes revolves around capacity market and then which is a long term market and then uh, what i am discussing today is impact of uh, wind power supplies on cost of balancing electricity demand and supply in great britain now this is a short term market uh, maybe minute to minute market you can say uh, or second to second market so how are we going to ensure that the reliability of electricity electricity supplies are ensured when we have lots of supplies coming from renewable generation. I am Dilip Kumar Jena. I am a PhD candidate, and I, I'm in fourth year of my PhD study, and I'm wrapping up my uh, PhD thesis, and hopefully by end of this year I should be able to submit. So the general context is that in UK. Uh, the government in June 2019 decided to reduce carbon footprint by 100% from the baseline value of 1990. And it means that they are going to be a carbon neutral country by 2050. Uh, this is a very ambitious goal. To achieve this ambitious goal, renewable ge generation plays a significant role. So in that regard, when we look into the data, we see that renewable generation from wind energy have gone up to 4.5 terawatt hour in August 2019 compared to 0 0.20 terawatt hour in April 2007, just in 12 years of time. I mean, it's almost 20 fold increase. But at the same, uh, but in the same period, the cost of balancing when it means the second to second balancing, minute to minute balancing of demand and supply of electricity in the transmission system has also increased to 108 million pounds uh, in uh, August 2019 compared to April 2007 values, which was 35 million. So on the left hand side, if you see there is a plot of expenditure and which is on the y axis, which is in uh, uh, pound per uh, pound millions, million pounds, you can say. And the x-axis is wind uh, supplies in terawatt hour. So we can see there seems to be an increasing trend, but we, we cannot infer anything from this. So my research revolves around, can we get some idea as to what is the percentage of uh, increase in this expenditure of, in the balancing cost or decrease in the cost of balancing due to wind 
generation in the system. So uh, how would uh, a, 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 a transmission system balance uh, uh, demand and supply? In UK, the demand and supply are balanced in the transmission system uh, at 50 hertz. It means that all uh, generate, generators which are supplying to grid are synchronized at a speed of 3000 rotation per minute, which, which means there are uh, 50 rotations every second in every rotor which is or every every generator which is connected to grid and uh, the statutory guideline is that uh, you cannot have frequencies below 49.5 hertz or above 50.5 hertz so when there is a deviation from 50 hertz uh, the balancing mechanism or comes into picture so this is 50 hertz line and the operational limit are fixed at 49.8 hertz and the statutory limits are fixed at 49.5 hertz so suppose uh, um, x axis represents uh, time and y axis represents uh, frequency at which the generators are connected to the grid so suppose there is a drop in frequency what, how will the uh, system operator balance it so as soon as there is a drop in frequency, within one second, frequency response uh, services kicks in and it, it, it starts supplying active power and it will keep on supplying for 30 minutes. Then within 10 seconds, the primary uh, generation or primary balancing services will kick in. And then within 30 seconds, secondary balancing uh, uh, of frequency re response will set in and then fast reserve will set in in two minutes and within 20 minutes a short term operating reserves will set, set in so you will see that they when you start supplying balancing energy it is it, is, it brings back the frequency again to 50 hertz so it has to be maintained within 49.8 hertz or 50.2 hertz within the operational limit now the services which are procured to balance the grid within few seconds are called frequency response services and the services which which acts on a time scale of few minutes maybe probably we can say two minutes to few hours maybe two hours or three hours from the time the deviation has happened from the frequency we call them reserve services now i don't want you to get scared from this uh, plenty text on the slide i just want you to focus on first two rows there are different kind of balancing services which are procured by uh, national grid in great britain first service is called frequency response services which are um, uh, which kicks in within few seconds actually to maintain the voltage After frequency response comes in reserve services. Reserve services acts from few minutes to few hours to balance the grid. And apart from this, we have system security services, which are very, very essential to maintain uh, security of supplies. Just in case, suppose there is an excess generation in the grid due to wind or offshore wind, those areas of grid could be cut off completely so as to maintain the reliability of supplies in other part of the grid or the other part of grid might require excess supplies so additional generation will come in so these supply security measures are very very important for minute to minute and second to second functioning of the grid so if you if you have seen the past slides there are actually in gb there are 17 services procured and um, one of the critique from the researcher was that these are too many services which could be procured on market basis. So they need to be rationalized. So what uh, government currently is doing in uh, Great Britain is kind of rationalizing this service and reducing the number of services which are procured. And the procurement are not just market based, but they are also bespoke agreement or negotiation basis or tendering agreement. So all sorts of things, uh, uh, sorry, all sorts of procurement are being employed by 
Great Britain uh, through national grid uh, system operator to maintain the balance between um, demand and supply of electricity every second. But it also leads to higher administrative costs. So the rationalization process is to reduce those transaction costs or uh, administrative costs and to see how we can uh, have lesser amount a uh, lesser number of services, but still have the same quality of supplies that we have observed in past, or e even better services when green energy comes into picture. So in my research, uh, what I have uh, done is um, divided these services into three categories, which is called voltage service. The second one is frequency service, and third one is reliability services. Now, we, uh, we can see the balancing of grid is a public good. It means that once you are uh, supplying balancing services, there is a jointness of supply. It means that when you are supplying to one consumer, you cannot exclude other consumer from consuming the services which you are providing. Uh, then there rises a question in economics, we call it free ridership problem. It means that suppose you are servicing one customer, the other customer freely can get that service. So in that scenario, there could not be private inven investment uh, because the marginal cost of, um, of, of supplies become zero. So in that regard, uh, government has to intervene. So in all the countries where the balancing is, uh, uh, is, is carried out, it's basically an intervention through government. Either they set up rule for balancing or a government uh, uh, agencies, uh, 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 a government agency leads the balancing. In my research, what I did was uh, to understand the balancing in GB through econometrics methodology. So the first step was to identify the determinants which uh, impact the balancing. So these this, the determinants could be wind generation, solar generation, or any other generation, or even the temperature changes. So what are those determinants? So I have identified 15 determinants of uh, 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 balancing, bal which impact balancing. Then what are the impact of those determinants on demand of balancing requirement? And how are those demand met by supplies? And what are the costs that are in incurred by sub, uh, electricity sub, uh, system operator and how those costs are allocated to those determinants. So the first step um, in this slide, I'm just covering this part. I, wa I want to show that there is a way we can understand the impact of the determinants on demand of balancing services. So my focus revolves around this, but research covers all the aspects of it. So uh, this is econometrics and the rest of the steps are basically procurement of public goods and how you allocate efficiently those costs. So what is the value of uh, econometrics approach? Uh, this is one of the first studies that has been carried out for GB market. And my research also is the first research uh, in, in GB, which actually sees the impact of determinants on voltage services frequency services and reliability services. And I have covered a uh, longer data so as to give a better picture from 2007 onwards to 2019. And the uh, estimate of this, uh, the outcome of these three steps is actually uh, very good in terms of uh, recommending policy amendments to um, by the government so as more renewable energies or more sustainable sources of energy could be integrated into the system. So what are the data dependent variables? So if you see voltage services, there is just one service uh, which is procured. And then in uh, frequency, there is one services, which is frequency response services. But in reliability, I've rationalized it to five services, but I will cover just on the constant services. What is constant services? So whenever wind energy is pushed into the national grid or grid, um, there is there, there might be situation of congestion due to the already existing generators connected to the system. So sometimes you have to uh, reduce the generation at one point, one geographic location, so as the wind 
which is gen being generated at a higher quantity could be pushed into the system more efficiently. So there are 15 independent variables. Uh, I just want to focus on wind. So uh, I, this graph shows on x-axis, um, this is um, um, year from 2007 to 2019 and on y-axis, I have represented two quantities. First is what is the expenditure in constant services and how much wind is generated. So there is a positive correlation we can see from the graph itself. So, but it's not very clear. So I wanted to assess it through the econometrics. So I run an error connection model uh, through OLS method. And if you see the, the dependent variable is uh, first difference of constant services, R is real value and constraint. So it is basically British pounds per megawatt of uh, energy procured. So if we see the independent variable wind, we will see that the probability of that is less than 0 0.05. So whenever probability is less than 0 0.05, we, we know that that particular variable impacts the balancing cost. So in this, we can see there are solar also impacts because the value is less than 0 0.05, but wind we can see is, is, is more significant at, because it, it, it is much, much lesser than 0 0.05. And uh, yes, so wind at levels at the first difference, uh, it impacts the supply of constant services. That is uh, the, the last slide was basically uh, short term, basically uh, looking into what are the increase in uh, cost of procurement of constant services with increase in wind generation. Therefore, the D terms appear here. Now, in the long term model, there is no D term over here. So this is the cost of balancing and we see that wind energy is significant because the probability values are less than 0 0.05 and wind is squared is also significant. So we can see the coefficient is 1.289, which is roughly one pound per, per megawatt hour for every gig, gigawatt hour of supply of wind. I, I run some tests to see if my estimates are, are, are robust enough. So I, I run uh, Jung box text and uh, there is no autocorrelation. The serial LM correlation I run, there is no autocorrelation. Uh, Jarke Berra test uh, normality, it should be normal, but uh, the in my case, the uh, residuals are not normally distributed, but there is uh, no arc effect. I saw that as well on Harvey Godfrey test. There is no uh, heteroscedasticity, and I run some visual tests also to see if the whatever I am claiming is correct. So the mo estimate seems to be robust enough to trust the results. So what are the conclusions? Um, the key conclusion that I come to is that I I wanted to understand: is there a causal relationship? Is wind impacting, really impacting um, uh, constraint services. So I, I run four kind of tests. One T statistics says wind is significant. Again, water test I run, wind is significant. And error correction term itself is significant. So wind actually impacts, but uh, in short run it impacts. But when we look into the long run, we find that constant service granger cause wind. It means that if we have more constant services in the system, then more wind could be procured in long term. So it's a very interesting finding because even if we have more wind in, 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 in more wind produced in a country, it cannot be supplied into grid unless, at least in GB, unless we have more constraint services already pre-procured. So once you ensure that constant services are procured in advance, you can pump in more in, uh, wind into the system. So marginal cost is roughly around 1.29 and it's decreasing 
when the wind generation increases uh, but in short run uh, the wind generation uh, um, marginal cost of 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 constraint services is uh, 1.03 and constant granger cause wind power supply it means that when we have more uh, 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 constant services already procured you can have more wind in the system what it leads to is then government should formulate policies where it can procure constant services fairly in advance through a market mechanism and what industries could do here is they need to innovate to reduce the prices of constant services thank you professor volkar sorry <laughs> Yes, excellent, Dilip. Very good. Um, there is a question. Can you answer this? Yes, please. Um, and it says, um, based on your presentation, Dilip, uh, in the UK, government regulates demand and supply on renewables, not the market. That's a question. Can you can you say a few, a few words about this? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, UK market is a multi-buyer and multi-seller model. So uh, at current, um, the current market arrangement is more free. So there is less government intervention in the market, in GB electricity market. So demand and supplies are balanced. Therefore, there is government intervention only in balancing. So all the suppliers, they already enter into agreement with the, the consumers or the demand centers in advance and they communicate to government or to ESO, the system operator, how much they are going to sell. And uh, similarly, the consumers also inform the sub, uh, system operator how much they are going to consume at a particular time. And the difference between the demand and supply is called imbalance. That imbalance has to be balanced through additional procurement by government. So in this, in, in, in GB, that balancing is done by national grid. Now national grid has uh, carved out a separate company. They call it national grid electricity system operator, NGESO. Thank you. Great. So, um, thank you, Dilip. Um, I don't think there is uh, another question right now, but again, there may be others coming coming your way. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer at any time. So, if it, there are any questions, it, uh, send it to me. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think I'm sure there will be people once they have reflected. Uh, but uh, they, we also have opportunity to uh, listen to um, the third presentation. Uh, Chi, are you there? Hi, everyone. Hi. Good. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Chi Chen um, uh, joined us uh, more recently than the others. So his research is at an earlier stage. Uh, but nonetheless, very interesting and particularly very interesting also um, for me as a lawyer. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you want to go ahead, please, Chi. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Firstly, I will show my slides with you guys. Let's, let's take a look. Hi, everyone. Uh, may I ask, can you, can you guys see my slides? Yes, we can. OK, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Chen Zhe. It is my great honor to be invited to make a presentation of my research topic today. It's about the application of relational contrast theory in the offshore oil and gas contractual framework. Uh, this research topic is based on my observation of the deficiency of the current oil and gas contractual framework. For instance, the Joint Operating Agreement, JOA, as a contract matrix for oil and gas projects. JOA is designed to resolve the problems that may happen during a project operation, such as the distribution of interest, the scope of the job operation, 
the role of the operator and the protection of the non-operator, risks and liability allocations, etc. However, JOA does not work as effective as expected. A simple example can be found in the default provision in JOA. The default provision requires the participants to make their capital injections timely and fully for stable operation of the project, and the defaulting party will be punished due to its breach. The forfeiture as the most common form of default provision, its nature might be constructed as a penalty that undermines its enforceability. Other various remedies, such as the withering interest, buyout, mortgage security, and compulsory straw, to a large extent, avoid being treated as a penalty, their values are strongly influenced by the stage at which the stage at which the at which stage the project has reached, and only take effect when the defaulting party's interests are worth much more than their default amounts. In this case, the potential defaulting parties can trickily plan at which stages of the project he will not join in, or just join in with tiny contributions that he can escape in nearly no cost unfairly leaving the huge financial burdens on the non-defaulting parties. Although some undesirable effects of the current default provision and the other problems in JOA have been acknowledged, few practical suggestions have ever been made, leaving the contracting parties in misgiving of how to protect themselves effectively. Considering the relational contract theory, which pays high regards to contracting parties' cooperation, reliance, and trust, I tend to rely on this theory to explore its ap application in the offshore oil and gas contractual framework. Revolving the research topic, I will open my canvas in general with three parts. Each part contains sub-questions to elaborate my grounds of arguments, which serve to complete a full picture of my research. The first part is the account of the relational contract theory. It aims to justify my theoretical basics for the research question. The second part provides an overview of the oil and gas industry, not least the offshore sector. And the last part tends to explore the applicability and efficacy of applying such a theory to the current offshore oil and gas contractual framework. And I will resort to the doctrinal methodology to start my research. The legal theory is the bridge between contract and contract law. It frames the way we look at problems uh, we solve the problem and even what we consider to be problems. In short, it provides the guiding ideology for the judicial practice of contract law towards contract. For the sake of insightful statement of legal theory, I will make my elaboration on the both ends of the bridge, contract and contract law first. On this part, I will explore the nature of contract. What is contract? It is a promise or a set of promises for the breach of which the law gives a remedy. Then, why contract law is required? The law is to secure the reliance and cooperation between the promises and the promisee. Once the state will ask, it will deploy its power to enforce a promise that is legally enforceable. However, assuming the promises are made by the parties at their own free will, why should the state, via the courts, enforce such a voluntary undertakings? In other words, it asks, what is the legitimate basis of contract law? And the last question is, how should contract law fulfill its roles? He asks the judicial practice of contract law towards contracts, and this question draws forth the discussion of contract theory. As I said before, theory frames the way we look at problems, the facts and the values we think relevant to the problems, to the solutions, and even what we consider to be problems at all. Contract theory explains normative and conceptual issues in contract law. It offers ways of thinking about contract law and guides the judicial practice of, of it. So I've initially offered a review of the development of the mainstream contract theories, which is known as from classical contract, law, classical contract theory to the neoclassical contract theory. Then I will describe other principal competitors to neoclassical contract theory, such as the death of contract theory, law, in, law and economies, empirical studies, sorry, empirical contract theory, critical legal studies, and relational contract theory. Along with, with, with the description of the core assertions of each theory, I will make critique of them and explain my preference of relational contract theory. After that, I will demonstrate the such theory by looking at its rise, progression, 
especially the status quo in academic contention and judicial practice where it offers an outlook for the advancement of such a theory. To, in, to insert implied good faith principle in the contracts that can be classified as traditional contracts. However, since English law, unlike the civil jurisdiction and major common jurisdiction, does not recognize a general principle of good faith, I will refer to the very recent authority and the learned judge's interpretation of such theory, attempt to narrow the application of implied good faith principle in a specific category of contracts, that is the traditional contracts. It starts with an overview of the oil and gas industry. After a brief illustration of three sectors in the oil and gas industry, the upstream, the midstream, and the downstream, I will turn to the offshore sector and make an introduction of its typical elements which are different from those in the onshore oil and gas project. In the offshore sector, besides exploration, it also includes issues like chartering vessels, building vessels, shipping finance, marine insurance, etc. Based on the distinct characteristics of the offshore oil and gas sector, I will set forth its contractual framework and select typical agreements of partners to discuss whether they fall into the definition of traditional contracts. In this process, the natures of the selected agreements of contracts, the roles and the relations between contracting parties will be underscored to support my assertion. Contracts that apply in the offshore oil and gas project could be regarded as the relational contract. Lastly, I attempt to explore the applicability and efficacy of applying such a theory to the current offshore uh, oil and gas contractual framework. I expect that such a theoretical application could be conducive to improve the offshore oil and gas contractual framework, to maintain the contracting parties' relationships, and to strengthen the performance of the project operation and cooperation, which correspondingly enhance the theory itself. And above is the skeleton of my research process. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, I, I, this, this the system keeps playing me a bit difficult uh, today, but um, yes, very good. Um, thank you. And uh, as I said, a very loyally approach as well, high quality, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very educational and highly, highly relevant. Uh, so I think this gives an amazing overview uh, of the breadth and the uh, depth really of our research here uh, at CUPMLP. Um, with thank you. Uh, three students of uh, the highest caliber uh, that he's showing that, um, you know, uh, with good effort and um, lots of support, you can uh, finish your studies in, in good time and be very, very successful. And then Dilip and um, Chi now showing as well that different stages of, of the preparation of the work um, and what it involves. So I think this is, uh, this is very, very good and uh, has given our, our Kazakh friends a good idea of where, um, where we are. Um, and the quality of our research. And I think, um, uh, Janet, if I can hand back to you now, um, do you want to say a few words? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Volker. Uh, um, thank you for our uh, three PhD students. So you are showcasing uh, the excellence of the center. And, uh, you know, really, I'm very proud of you. Um, Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Volker, Robin. I think perhaps what I would do now is to uh, answer some of the questions we have received earlier. Uh, Alia has forwarded to Professor uh, Robin and myself. So I would just to handle those uh, PhD uh, focus first. Then later, I think maybe Professor uh, Volker will, will you know, answer the rest, then I can just add up if, if there is anything else. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, so what uh, we have got quite um, some, a few questions about the, the PhD related, uh, first of all. Um, so some are asking about the application procedures for 
uh, applying for PhD and the uh, admission rate? Actually, um, that's a very good question. Uh, I think procedure um, is a kind of standard one. I have put the uh, provided the link there uh, for PhD application. So you normally you are expected to submit an application online. So there are a few uh, kind of types of documents you need to submit. Uh, the most important ones are your transcripts, your degree certificates, bachelor's and master's, and then your research proposal. Uh, as I have said, you know, the research proposal at this stage doesn't have to be a substantive one. I mean, three to five pages wouldn't be anyway. However, we need to know your ideas and to see the potential uh, of your doing a PhD. Okay, then also we need to identify a potential or two supervisors for you at this stage. Um, the topic, I think, is not absolutely 100%. You have to, okay, you submitted this uh, proposal, then you have to do that in the end. So you can change it. You may change it after you entered the center. Then you think, oh, maybe I, I would like to change my topic. Or sometimes it's just the change of focus. Okay, so it's, uh, I would say at this stage, it's quite flexible. Perhaps the only thing you won't change considerably is the disciplinary background because you really have to use your background knowledge to support your PhD. That is something I wouldn't see you would change, um, you know, considerably. But otherwise, the topic on its own can be changed. I mean, even um, some of my uh, students have changed their topics after you know we had some discussions then we found okay it's more sensible for them to do something else than uh, initially planned so that is not the issue the, the mission rate is not I, I, I guess maybe I, I don't really have a rate uh, it's just like based on really three key things. One is about your academic performance. Secondly, it's about your, uh, really the, the, the proposal you have submitted, whether we have got the supervision capacity to, you know, uh, support you. Uh, and also it's like, uh, you know, whether uh, really the, 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 the was a kind of, you know, um, um, whether even, and I, I think that was, and the fewer times, even if we have got some um, expertise there, but if we have got too many students there, so we, we may, and that, that is, you know, a rare uh, situation, we have to decline some applications because of the, 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 the large number we can handle. But I think nowadays we, we, we are in, improving our kind of, you know, situation to say, okay, we, we will try different means. So that wouldn't really happen much as long as you fit the uh, admission standard. I think if you do want a rate, I can give you is like uh, about 80% because the the 20% if I have rejected, I mean, uh, until recently, I was in charge of the uh, CEP MLP uh, PhD program for quite some time. Um, so, uh, but now a, a, a colleague just, uh, you know, uh, took over from me because now I'm, I'm in charge of the school's uh, PhD, I mean, doctoral programs. Um, I think basically it is about uh, uh, mismatch of the of the uh, expertise if you you are focused on engineering uh, related or something more technical we don't really have the expert expertise then we we really can't accept you and also some are because of the academic performance okay so that is basically what uh, we will see the key uh, issues we, we will be really uh, considering and um, yeah, then uh, you can also do, as I have said, you do that remotely. Uh, you have two ways. One is to do a PhD part-time. Part-time is also like quite similar to a PDP. You need to come to campus twice a year, at least once a year, ideally twice a year to meet with your supervisors. 
and also to meet with your fellow students. And if possible, you should also schedule that, you know, with our PhD staff PhD seminar, then you would have an opportunity to present at this PhD seminar. Then you will get feedbacks, which I mean, our students may be able to tell you, um, you know, that was very beneficial to their uh, study experiences. And also not every discipline, that is something I can see, not every single discipline would have this fortnightly uh, PhD seminars. Uh, but that is a mechanism we have built for the past 20 years to support our PhD students. So that is part-time PhD. Uh, another one is this PDP, so professional doctoral program. Then you will take the first two years, you take online courses, uh, but you do come to campus twice a year. Uh, so basically you will be, you know, uh, do your work as normal, uh, but just come to visit us once or twice a year, uh, you know, when it is possible for you. So that is uh, the answer for that question. Um, and also your yeah, training conferences. Yes, I have talked about that. Uh, and also, yeah, there was a, uh, a question to say uh, after the PhD, whether we would be, you know, having help looking for, you know, um, job or something, that is something we would prepare you to be able to, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, get an academia job, we will prepare you fully, you know, when you are at the center, but we can't guarantee anything because uh, I don't know, at least at the UK and European countries, and even I think maybe most of the countries, you do have, you know, this kind of process of, of selection by the institutions. So if there is a vacant, you just, you know, submit an application, then, you know, if you are better than others, you will be selected. So that is what we will help you, but we can't really guarantee to say, okay, if you studied with us, we, we, we will, uh, you know, just guarantee a job. But also uh, a lot of our students uh, have, worked for the international uh, organizations like OPEC and UN, you know, uh, some agencies, if they had some, you know, legal uh, departments. So we have got graduates working there and uh, more than half are working at the academic institutions, either, you know, in other countries or back home in their uh, own institutions. And also some went back to the industries. So. Uh, there is a variety of kind of you know uh, um, places uh, for our uh, graduates, um, and also we have we are very proudly to say we have got quite a few, at least more than a dozen I think now are working as kind of you know uh, energy uh, ministers or you know minister of of some of the uh, governments you know in their home countries. So they are very high profile, and also the international. Energy Forum, the uh, current uh, Secretary General is our graduate. Uh, so we, we have got quite a few uh, you know, high profile uh, alumni uh, from our PhD programs. So you, you can just search and uh, we hope you will be one of those uh, in the future. Thank you. So I think this, those are PhD related uh, questions. I think maybe I'll just give the floor to uh, Professor um, Robin for him to, you know, answer some other questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, that, uh, this is, uh, you, you have uh, answered, uh, I think, the list uh, that Alia kindly sent to us uh, very comprehensively and obviously this is all uh, very interesting for um, the participants in this webinar. Um, I think as, I, as far as I see, there are two other more general questions that I can probably uh, take up here. Um, and then one is, uh, what kind, one, one question is, what kind of research you conduct related to Kazakhstan? Uh, and can we invite your researchers to share findings? And that is, uh, a government's request. Um, and I can say, yes, um, very much so. Um, we would, uh, we would, um, we would be honored to come to um, uh, Kazakhstan. And uh, once the, the travel situation has improved, um, 
and share our findings from the broad area um, and portfolio of research uh, we undertake. Uh, and uh, that's both two from my it's the two from my colleagues from the economics uh, side um, of CPMOP staff uh, from law uh, as well as political science. Uh, there is uh, our research um, covers really um, all aspects of energy uh, from uh, from fossil to uh, renewables. And uh, some very exciting developments, I think, also um, relating to hydrogen, which is probably very interesting uh, for um, a, uh, a for, for Kazakhstan in particular, um, as it has uh, uh, a much uh, natural gas that can be converted into into hydrogen, hydrogen blue blue so kind of blue hydrogen. Um, yes, fantastic, and. Um, uh, our contact details um, uh, are available uh, certainly um, on, on our website. They are available, I think, uh, via Alia, uh, both mine and, and uh, Janet's. Um, and um, then that, so Kazakhstan certainly is, a, is, is very high on our list. We have another, uh, Janet and I will have a meeting with the um, Kazakhstan ambassador to uh, the UK later um, uh, in, in, in this week. Um, and then there's also a question whether we have uh, certified training for industry managers and executives. Uh, and we do have that. Uh, it's um, it will be done, uh, it's normally done in the shape of um, so-called uh, CPD events and also uh, summer schools. Um, that summer school cannot take place this year simply because of the COVID-19 travel restrictions, uh, but uh, it will again take place uh, in the next year. Uh, and um, so you people are uh, most cordially invited to uh, to come to Dundee for this purpose, and we have um, uh, very high, highly qualified um, uh, people teaching the summer course, uh, and you will have an, a, a certificate uh, uh, at the end. So yeah, you don't have to come for the full year uh, if you don't have time, which is understandable. If you're, uh, then you do should uh, consider coming to um, either the summer school or a so-called continuing professional development course, the CPD course that the, uh, the center offers. So if I, if I read this correctly, um, my maybe last point uh, here on this list is whether we, I see the educational process change next year and whether we, I recommend to wait for a year and apply after. Um, I think the situation is rapidly uh, moving in the direction of uh, normalcy, if I can say so. Uh, I think uh, clearly the, um, in the UK, these, um, the broad, um, the broad uh, restrictions of the lockdown are, are very quickly being lifted. Uh, we expect, the university expects to teach uh, in a quite normal fashion uh, from October onwards. Um, and I think by that time we will also have uh, quite normal uh, travel uh, travel uh, links again in place. Um, so yeah, the, the the government will publish the UK government will publish a list of countries uh, that uh, visitors from do not are not will not be expected to quarantine to self isolate. And that list hasn't been published, I think, yet, but is expected imminently, uh, and it will also be reviewed constantly. So, um, so this is this is something that is clearly uh, uh, going in the direction of what I, what you could call normalcy, uh, very quickly. So, no reason to, no reason to defer really um, on on that account. Yeah, I think uh, I think that that is. Um, the list of questions, and most of them, as I've said, has have already been very competently answered by uh, Janet as far as they relate to our outstanding uh, PhD program. And I should say that Janet mentioned that she has now um, been asked to take up the role of PGR director at the school level, so I one level up, so to speak, 
from us, and that is a recognition of a long-standing, excellent um, work with our PhD community. So congratulations again, Janet, on doing this. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, I think that's um, that's all for me now at this point. Look, can I? Yeah. Can I just add add a little bit about the later part? Yes, um, I think yes, I fully uh, agree with uh, what. Uh, Professor Wilkins said, you know, you don't really have to wait until next year. Just apply now because it will take some time for the, you know, the, the process to go through. And then really, I mean, after you have got everything ready, almost maybe it's early next year. Uh, and also, yeah, the situation is, uh, you know, improving uh, currently, uh, especially in Scotland. Scotland has taken a more cautious uh, procedure to, you know, uh, lift to the lockdown. So it is, I would say, same, safer than in, even uh, England. Uh, another thing I want to say about the research uh, related to Kazakhstan, actually, personally, I have written quite a few articles on uh, China's energy diplomacy towards Central Asia. Uh, inside those articles, Kazakhstan is one of the main countries I have dealt with. Uh, but the most recent one was published last uh, December. I think maybe the paperwork, paper version has not come out yet. So I can't really share that online uh, yet. But uh, I also wrote maybe one or two uh, in the past. I mean, uh, which if you, you are interested, you can, you can find that from ResearchGate. Uh, so if, I mean, when the situation improves, we would be more than happy to, you know, visit Kazakhstan. I haven't been there, although I have dealt with, my research has dealt with Kazakhstan for quite some time, for, for nearly two decades. Um, but uh, really, I haven't uh, really had the opportunities. So we would be uh, even online if for the moment, I mean, the whole center, we have got the economists, lawyers, uh, and we, we will be happy to have some connections, you know, with the media uh, in Kazakhstan. If you have got any issues to talk to us, uh, just, you know, send us the, the email or something beforehand. We will be very happy to, you know, talk to you. Uh, and then if you have got, you know, uh, academic visitors, uh, then you are more than welcome to send them uh, and also, you know, just contact us beforehand. And if you have people to be trained, and we have, like uh, Professor Voka has said, we have got the summer school and also the uh, special, specially designed kind of, um, not workshops, training sessions, three to five days. You can ask, you know, what kind of things you want to ask to focus on and how long, normally it's three to five days. Then we will, you know, uh, give you a kind of, you know, um, a budget uh, evaluation. Uh, then you can see what time is, uh, you know, suitable and we can just uh, negotiate that uh, both sides can find the, the, their convenience then we can certainly, you know, uh, provide what you want to. So that, yeah, that, that is what I would like to say. Thank you so much. Okay, back to you. Okay. Alia? Are you, are you, are you there? Hi, Voka. Yes. Hi, Voka. I've finished. Good. Uh, I think I want to give it, give the word back to um, Alia. Alia, are you there? Uh, yes, dear Professor Volker. Thank you, dear speakers and attendees, for joining us today, especially speakers for sharing your amazing presentations and thoughts. I think we'll definitely follow up on these ideas uh, with you, Janet Volker, and speakers. So maybe just ask uh, final words from each speaker and share your thoughts about our uh, webinar, and then we can conclude. Uh, yes, excellent. Uh, so um, maybe maybe we, sh we have a word uh, briefly from the PhD students, um, starting, with, um, starting with Betty, please. Right. Uh, OK, thank you very much. Uh, I've enjoyed the webinar. It's been a great uh, opportunity for me to share uh, about the PhD that I have. Thank you so much, Alia. Such a great opportunity for me and for all of us. It's a great, thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Dilip? Yes, uh, Alia, thank you so much for giving us opportunity to make a presentation. And Dundee is home. Um, it's a good place to do research and uh, you will find that uh, the, the, the research community is very diverse and is quite welcoming. So I come from India and I have really enjoyed my stay here. So I will recommend uh, 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 students from Kazakhstan to come as soon as possible and join the program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Chi? Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think that this is a good place for the research. There's not that much distraction, I think. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you, guys. Thank you. Jan Janet, do you want to say a word? Janet? Yes, uh, sorry, I have to play okay. this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have really uh, enjoyed a lot of this. And also, I hope, you know, uh, we have provided the information you uh, needed. But if you have got any uh, other inquiries, please do contact Alia or through her to me as well and also maybe to Professor Avoka uh, Robin then we'll be very happy to you know answer your uh, questions and maybe welcome you to Dundee in the near future okay thank you very much Alia as well and Michael uh, thank you very much yes yes uh, very very briefly uh, fantastic uh, thanks to all the speakers uh, congratulations on your work um, thank you to uh, Janet for, um, for organizing this really with Alia together. Uh, she's the spirit behind this. Um, I think it's clear that uh, Dundee has uh, so much to offer if you, if you really want to do uh, uh, research in energy and in, in, in a location that's beautiful, uh, but uh, not too, it doesn't have too many distractions as, as she said, <laughs> although you can go to the big cities as well, uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow, it's not far, far at all if you, if you want, um, want this. And we have of course the, uh, the famous B&A Museum now. Uh, but uh, anyway, we are, you, Dundee, Dundee is the place for you to come um, and uh, we hope to, to be able to come to Kazakhstan as well uh, soon. Uh, and on that uh, notion, I think uh, I would wish uh, a very good day to everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, see you next time then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. So, thank you, Alia. And our speakers, PhD speakers. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.